to two gentlemen. One of them has a beard. And both of them are from Carnegie Mellon University. Woo! Hey! We'll have an open session about that later. <laughs> so, uh, apparently you're supposed to say Carnegie and not Carnegie. But like, if you're from New York, like, if you like happen to ask, like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall, you know, you know, you know your choice. <laughs> 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 Houston Street, exactly. Uh, 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 is that street really named after the Texas town? Um, so anyway, Todd and Aaron, they're going to talk about the culture shock, uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing this presentation. I think a lot of us have gone through this, a version of this, and uh, I heard that there might be popular culture references involved. No. We'll, we'll get some in there. They're not on the slides anymore. All right. Yeah, without well, further ado. Hey, thank you. Yeah, my name is Aaron, and this is Todd. We're from uh, Software, Engineer Software Engineering Institute, which is an FFREC that's under the umbrella of Carnegie Mellon University. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, every time we say Carnegie Mellon, this is like Pee Wee's Playhouse. You're going to scream, and it'll be wonderful. <laughs> Um, so, I do want to apologize uh, for this next slide you're about to see. I did not want to include this. There's a lot of stuff about this next slide I did not want to include, but we were required to do it for legal reasons, so I'm just going to move forward through it. Brace and... yourselves. Okay, there we go. We're done with that. <laughs> so, we're going to move on. We'll spend the next uh, six hours, that's how much time we get, six hours, to give a brief history of DevOps, where it came from. From the beginning. From the beginning. So, in the beginning, there was waterfall. And this is just to give a brief overview for those of you who may not understand why we even talk about DevOps. This hopefully will be brief. I'm making it too long. So uh, waterfall was really focused on these, the functional silos of tasking. And it was all very uh, sequential. So you don't start, you can't do anything until all of the requirements are done. You can't do, you know, and so on and so forth. It became uh, kind of this, I, I, for some places, sure, it, it can work, uh, but for most places, it becomes kind of a human centipede of SDLC. So, so it, it caused problems. Um, I'm taking a requirements phase, everybody, if it's like that. <laughs> so, um, so to address a lot of the problems of, of the waterfall, we started adopting much more agile uh, methodologies. And what this did was allowed us to move at a much more rapid pace as development teams and brought customers closer into that so we have a, a, that shorter feedback loop so we can do uh, much more rapid improvement cycles. Right, so as enterprises started to, starting to do Agile within their development group, what actually happened in reality was, thanks Jess Humble for this, water scrum fall, and also <laughs> Dave West who made it up. But uh, over here on the left we have the business that has to do a big slow monolithic process they have to forecast in advance, a year in advance how much money they're going to spend. We have development happily being agile, releasing, doing uh, bi-weekly releases, chunking off thin slices of transparent uh, uh, functionality over to QA and operations. We have to then integrate with all the existing systems that a uh, piece of functionality has to operate with, test it, and then finally release it. So development started you know, throwing the ball over and over again. Catch, catch, catch. And that's just didn't work for quality, which is where we get an extension of Agile to envelope other areas of the business. And that's where DevOps comes in, where everybody's uh, unified through having shared goals to fulfill business needs. And we achieve this through collaboration. Collaboration becomes a very key part of DevOps. And that's why we're focused on a theme that we're focusing on here. Um, with these teams, uh, we have a dev team, we have an operations team. We'll just kind of simplify it to that. And these teams have conflicting priorities where the developers are trying to introduce change, they're trying to introduce new features, things that are, are different. And the operations team is trying to maintain service availability. So somewhat conflicting uh, priorities. Uh, interesting note about the word priorities is that it actually wasn't plural for about 500 years as it existed. There was, you could only have one priority in 
what you were doing. There was no such thing as priorities. Um, and so after 500 years, somebody's like, well, no, I actually have two priorities. And so we added the plural version of the word to the English language. Wait, we got multi threading, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's an interesting way to look at what, what is the priority of your team. Of, and when I say team, of the organization. And that's where we start to get into these shared goals, where we're trying to deliver business value to a customer. We're not trying to just introduce features for the sake of features or maintain availability for the sake of availability. We're, we're, our goals across divisions is business value. If we take away business value, then there's really we're not really doing anything for anybody. So with these, uh, related to these conflicting priorities, if development's torturing operations with uh, doing very rapid releases that you know they can't realistically take on, uh, you know, causing instability and service unavailability, which is you know contrary to our goals, there's going to be animosity and conflict between them. And also, you know, as a developer, if operations pushes back and says, uh, no, 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 let's put the brakes on this. This isn't going to work. Uh, development gets stressed out because they're the ones who promise the dates that things are uh, available in traditionally organized organizations. Uh, so it helps to increase empathy between these two groups. You know, that's what we want to achieve. An, in an interesting study was done up in Montreal at McGill University where they studied uh, empathy and stress as it relates to strangers, two actors that are uh, very unfamiliar with each other. What they did was they put two people who are friends, who are very familiar with each other in a room and measured their empathy, and their empathy was you know, very high up here. But if they put two strangers in, the, in a room together, their empathy was very low for that other person. And they, relate, they linked this to the stress that we feel whenever we interact with complete strangers. It's probably some evolutionary thing where we don't know if we're going to talk to a stranger, they're going to come punch us in the face or something. But, and they proved this by giving strangers a drug which inhibited their, flight or fu their fight or flight response. Nice. So those two strangers, they had the same empathy as if they were right. best buds for life. So the, the purpose of the presentation is uh, we have some samples of drugs. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, no. that, yeah. It would be awesome. <laughs> we, that is not an opinion we have. Can we record over that? Okay. We'll fix that in post. We'll fix that in post. No. Since we can't take a drug, we need fear. We need to have uh, some prior all. Somebody would be pushing. No, go ahead. Deploy. 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 It's okay. Anyway, what they did, take two strangers together. Uh, make them play Rock Band, the video game, for 15 minutes, and two complete strangers then shifted to being having the same empathy as friends for life. So all they had to do is play Rock Band for 15 minutes, and they shifted from the stranger zone over to the friend zone. So we may not, Rock Band may not work for all of us. Um, I love it, but other people don't because they suck at it. And so uh, you have to look at the culture of the team, the people that are that are involved, and figure out what are the best ways. This involves, believe it or not, empathy to understand what is going to work best for the people that you're working with to to break down those barriers to provide shared experiences across all the team members. Uh, we have a, a colleague at, at uh, SEI who, um, in the early '90s, he was managing a. a Develop, development team, operations team, and I know this is gonna shock everybody in the early 90s because it was such a blissful time. Those two teams really butted heads. It was really bad. And so he started trying to figure out, okay, well, we'll do the shared lunches. Get everybody out and we have lunch. For that team, it didn't work. So he said, okay, we'll do pizza after work. And then that didn't work. And then they tried bowling. And so, yeah, this was pre-rock band, so. <laughs> and and pre-week, so they actually had to use a real ball. So um, none of those experiences for that particular team worked. And I think it's important to, to emphasize for that particular team. You may have a team of just bowling fanatics, and bowling's going to work great to, to break down those barriers. The other issue is that the lunches, the uh, activities, all that really happened is that your operations people went and hung out with the operations people, and then all that. Yeah. <laughs> and so you still have all these clicks. You, their, their clicks are being maintained throughout these shared experiences. What ended up working for them is, yes, another video game, was Doom Deathmatch. Um, and so 
playing Doom across all across teams actually created some shared experiences that they could break down these barriers and stop treating each other like strangers. Um, if you're just starting out implementing DevOps, or you're finding that you're running into some of these hurdles of, of animosity between teams, um, then at the very least, starting by knowing the names of people that you're working with, studies have shown that just by knowing the names of people uh, has the ability to, if not really increase communication, it makes everybody feel as if communication is happening, and it gives everybody a greater trust in the people that they're working with, just knowing the names. Um, yeah, in fact, so something that we instituted at our workplace, uh, they started uh, you know, really getting into SharePoint and uh, adding our photo ID badge pictures to our Outlook account so that whenever you received an email, you could see that person's mug shot on that email. So you could start associating names with the face. It turns out that through this process, there was uh, somebody that I dealt with only through service desk tickets and email, and you know, it was a very uncomfortable relationship because I was just annoyed by that person. Once they started doing the badge picture thing, I could see who that person was. I realized that, hey, I'm really, have, I see them every day in the coffee room and talk to them, and like, we're cool. And just by <laughs> associating, that totally changed my outlook of how to work with them, and instead of you know blaming them and having animosity, it opened up a better you know, working relationship with them. Yeah, again, the focus when you're looking at this is it is an individual uh, activity for your organization. There isn't necessarily a one-size-fits-all because we are complex systems, to quote an earlier uh, uh, talk, is, is that we are so different that we need a different approach uh, for each team. <laughs> Communication transparency, those are like instances of shift left. If we have uh, transparency and we share information and communicate it to where we need it, then that's shifting it left and making it available earlier in the process. Those who don't know what shift left is, uh, let's see if I, we, a project starts here and then we have victory over here. If we find uh, information late in the process, closer to our victory that sets us back, but there's no reason why we didn't know this information. We should shift it left and bring it closer to the uh, front of the process to increase uh, the success of outcomes. We'll hit on that more later. Yeah, so let's say you know we're in that famous last mile of a project. Um, you know, we think we're gonna slide in the home plate and actually achieve success and get something working into production, but because some piece of information was left out, because it wasn't communicated uh, properly, we fall into what we call grumble pits, where we, we grumble our organ trail cart gets stuck in the mud, we have to fix it, somebody gets dysentery. Somebody always gets dysentery. Lots of free work, <laughs> lots, uh, lots of setbacks. And then we have to go back again, and everybody grumbles about it. So in order to a way to circumvent these grumble pits is by making sure that we have enough communication and transparency to make that information available sooner. A way that we do this in DevOps is through tool integration automation. Integrating our source control with our issue tracker, with our continuous integration, through all this automation, we, have, we can put systems in place to pipeline this data to the actors who need it. The, making sure that we have these single sources of truth is critical when you're dealing with communication and transparency. Uh, for example, if we have a requirements document, great. Our developers take it and they put it into issue trackers. And then we may have a client that we're working with that has their own copy of the requirements document. If, if any of the things start to get updated without the other one getting updated, we're introducing significant amounts of risk. Uh, and that's, that's what we want to get away from. So the idea is to then bring it back into the single source of truth of what, what content is king. Um, and one example of this where we, ha we had, again, with requirements documents, is uh, several years ago, I, I was tasked with having to find the latest version, the correct version of a requirements document, which meant I was digging through emails. I'm digging through, trying to figure out, oh, is it on SharePoint? Oh, no, they didn't upload that version to SharePoint. So it's actually on that person's file. You know, it's... A terrible process if anybody ever has to deal with documentation, which I actually really love it. So if you want to talk about documentation, <laughs> let's chat. Um, and so 
one of the things that I ended up doing was uh, working with the team, we centralized all of our documentation into our source control so we could treat it the same way that we treat our code. So it's plain text. We, um, we have, it, uh, have an automated build system. We have a build configuration, our build server, that actually builds our documentation into the artifacts that are used and then disseminated. So it generates an HTML, it generates a PDF, it generates a Word document that can then be given to the people that need it. But as far as we're concerned, the single source of truth for our documentation is what's checked in. And because it's checked in and in our build server, we can also start to then attach builds of our documentation to builds of our, our applications. So then it, it really helps when we're trying to go back and version things. Anyway, that's a, that's a different, yeah. I'm getting a little too deep into that. So um, the idea is, again, looking for those single sources of truth. Yeah, another instance of this, and it goes along with the tooling range and automation points we have on the slide, but you know, infrastructure is code. That's uh, communication. It's communi ops helping communicate with dev, you know, what production is going to look like. Containers help with this, um, you know, Chef, Puppet, all those tools, treating your uh, infrastructure as code. You know, it is what it is, yeah. and you know we can we can trust what we're uh, testing. Anything we can version, then we can start to test and diff, and it really helps. Our next aspect is creating a no blame culture. Now we all know that mistakes do happen; they're going to happen. The S word is going to hit the fan eventually. Whenever this happens, we must leave emotion out of it. We don't have the time or the energy for it. Uh, so. Whenever mistakes happen, you know, everybody just focuses on fixing the problem, making sure that it doesn't happen again. A no blame culture is a culture where people aren't afraid to take risks in order to, you know, uh, further the craft and push the envelope on what's possible to innovate. Um, so the blame culture, having a, a culture of blame, Really, we, and I'm sure we all have stories where we've worked in a blame culture. And sometimes, when we're in a good culture, we still slip back into that blame thing. It's kind of a, 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 a visceral reaction to problems. But when we can shift that into a culture of accountability, where rather than looking for who caused the problem, we actually empower our team members to be accountable, to be responsible for, for the, the things that they're doing, for the things they're pushing out, that accountability can uh, can have people really step up to the plate in ways that you would not expect to have happen. Um, it's how? Kind of, so, how do we yeah. start a culture of accountability, right. or how does it step yeah, up? Yeah, exactly. Yes. The, so, I think what really can start to happen is again, we we have to to have accountability. There needs to be the communication transparency. You have to have the shared uh, the shared goal. Make sure that you have this common vision. And that, that does not help, that doesn't happen by fiat, that doesn't happen uh, by force, where you go in and you say, hey, I wrote a memo, here's the email, we are all focused on this, and everybody goes, you're such an idiot. <laughs> um, and and you, they, everybody just ignores it. Right. It goes again to the shared experiences, whether the shared experiences are as silly as playing rock band or as uh, it, critical as um, Making something work that's broken. If if something's works, if something's broken, getting the op, ops team and the development team to be working together to fix that problem, and not the hey, here's the problem, and you say no, you're the problem, and I say no, you're the problem. That back and forth of, of blame starts to erode, and it will, it will kill the trust. Um, and so it's using these opportunities to uh, the opportunities of these of, of pain to build these shared experiences that can draw people together. Also a reminder of Melissa's slide where she showed her team, you know, everybody's standing together, you know, devs here and ops here, the lines are blurred and the walls are lowered so that, you know, everybody's part of a team right. and nobody has, you know, one specific job. The job is to, you know, unite towards the business goals and, you know, instilling yeah. that. I found myself having to work on, uh, on code for vagrant boxes and Docker containers that, and I'm not, I'm not an operations person, but I can start now to troubleshoot some of those issues in ways that I couldn't before when we're just dealing with bare metal. Um, it, it, I found that that system was much more intuitive to me. And so it allows me now to work when we are deploying things. I can work much more closely with my operations group to get that done. Um, I'm going to have to move on, though. Yeah. OK, so uh, <laughs> next. Yeah. Well, let's... <laughs> so, um, 
the people closest to the work. This is a, another critical one, is as a manager, we want to we want to take the lead from the people closest. So this goes back to what we were ta talking about, where we can't force people to adopt the principles. Um, but we have to listen to the team, listen to the people who are closest to the work about what improvements can be made. Um, that uh, The documentation example was another good example. That didn't come from uh, a manager saying, wow, we really have a lot of problems with this documentation stuff. That was me saying, I am sick and tired. If I have to find one more Word document, um, <laughs> then I make an empty threat. But, uh, <laughs> but what I did is instead, I, I worked with team members to figure out, well, what is the solution? How can we implement this? And we did a whole bunch of iterations until we found something that worked for us. And then I said to management, hey, we did this, and we're going to use this, and so are you. So, um, and, and they actually accepted it. I mean, that, that's nice. And so. So it's, it's important to listen to those people. And I think the management roles, I think, are... Yeah, uh, so management's role in all this is to you know, nurture an environment where people are comfortable to uh, you know, send up their thoughts, their observations, and empower them. And an example of this is... So, yeah, this is a story I wanted to share as well. So in the medical field, uh, which has so much overlap with development and operations, uh, in the 50s, nurses started to... That's when they started to... Uh, take the, the vital signs of patients every six hours, like oh, what's your pulse, what's your, you know, what's your pain level, things like that. And um, they started doing that not at the behest of the doctors, because the doctors didn't care. They didn't, the hospitals didn't care. The nurses cared. The nurses were the closest ones to the patient, and they found that if they tracked these measurements, that they could actually identify when problems were going to happen with that person. And so this is a change that came from the people closest to the work. Um, and now, it's standard practice. If anybody's ever been in a hospital, I guarantee you, at 2 in the morning, when you're trying to hit that morphine thing, and the nurse comes in, what's your pain level? And you're like, oh, anyway, that's a, we can talk about it. We'll have another open space about that. So, um, I think that's it. I think that's yeah, and the important thing is, like, to the doctors back then, it was obvious, yeah. or, you know, not very important to make this checklist, to make a formalized process where we check these things and document. They weren't very close, so, you know, it seemed like such a simple thing that they didn't formalize right. that process, but, you know, it was the people down with boots on the ground who were able to, you know, uh, find that process improvement. And it's leadership's role to take out the no-blame culture and, uh, empower people to be able to uh, do this. I think another point that was made, I'm going to crib off that uh, the previous talk a lot, um, was the, the credit aspect. Um, I, we were working with one customer actually, and we had a particular uh, user in that customer who was super helpful. She, she gave us so much good feedback. And by good feedback, I don't mean positive feedback. I mean, she told us everything that went wrong with detailed log reports, and I was doing this, and then this happened. I'm like, wow, this is, these people need to know. They need to know what they have. Um, and so that was a, a thing that I did, is this is a person who's not even in my team, but I'm going to give her the credit of what she did, and I talked to her managers and her superiors and let them know that, hey, this person that you have over here deserves something. Like, you need to recognize the effort that she's putting in because she's going above and beyond. Right, so that will just encourage people to... Right. Report those things up and behave in those ways. We already talked about shift left, but we have a whole slide dedicated to it. Um, security is a big aspect. I've seen it. Security is an afterthought, or you know, sort of slapped on at the end, kind of like a McGriddle uh, syrup. Sometimes best inside the pancake instead of like slapped on at the end. Security even more important. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it gets messy. Different types of offering. Yes. And I think that it also ties in with because like security is often like a hurdle for like becomes a hurdle for people to overcome and because and uh, for two reasons one is that it's like rigid often and the second reason is that it's transparent people like don't tend to understand the uh, security structure of the environment so yeah so just to sort of hit on that um, you know I'm a developer and developers work very closely with the business towards the front of our project the Development's focus is on showing the business functional requirements, things they ask for, things that they can see. So what this shift left you know, concept is all about is 
changing the culture to where the non-functional requirements, the things that are needed to successfully run something in production are thought about and you know, promoted earlier you know, because of our na development's natural inclination to want to delight the customer with things that they can touch and see and say hip hip hooray about. Um, we have that. We're running out of time. Okay, so we want to shift left operational testing, stuff like load testing, failover, how do we log, disaster recovery, these things have to be thought of you know, back in the de development stage, not just after user acceptance testing. And uh, I think I'm gonna kind of just sum up my feelings here, uh, is that the DevOps, we talk a lot about the relationships between the developers and the operations team. And really develop, DevOps becomes a philosophy that should permeate every aspect of the organization. Uh, for example, our presentation that we were going to give, every slide here was an episode from Full House, and then we passed it through legal, and they said, I'm sorry, no, you cannot use any images of Full House, because we don't want to get sued. It was, per it was a perfect analogy, because you have the Olsen twins in a cluster, so if the Michelle service, you know, it needs to stay up, and we always have a backup on standby. So we keep the Mary Kate service there. So, so yeah, perfect, and we couldn't use it. So. Um, it's a culture that permeates everything. Everything needs to shift left, whether it's legal departments, whether it's uh, marketing, uh, business, operations, security, all that needs to be a part of the project and thought of with all of these things in mind. Right, and um, I think my, the most important aspect to me to take away is to you know, foster a culture where uh, people aren't afraid to take risks. I've been in a lot of places where uh, even though day-to-day -day lives were horrible and people were you know, pretty much tortured by on-call being crazy all the time. Nobody was willing to stick their neck out and try to do things in a different, better way because of a blame culture that was in place. Absolutely. I don't know if we have time for questions, but... All right, a couple questions. We got two. And the clapping. We do appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> We're not for profit. So how does that impact the ability for you to be able to implement this kind of methodology that you say uh, without like having something like profit being the driving force? Because for a lot of us who are in uh, project industry, <laughs> right, right, the, a lot of the things that you're mentioning make a lot of sense, but they make sense in a situation to which there's not a lot of financial uh, requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you kind of introduce some of these like methodologies that you talked about to people who also have to answer to people who write checks and eventually get paid? Uh, you know, that's a very, very common question. The question was, you know, in a pro you know, uh, trying to do a transformation, it costs money and there's an upfront overhead and upfront costs to uh, making that happen. What I've seen a lot of times is, you know, you have to gather data and to prove that, you know, this stuff works. It really does. There's a lot of public <laughs> research out there now. Is, uh, you know, doing these things, uh, more and more organizations are doing these things, and if, you know, they read the literature, or there's research published that this stuff just works. But, uh, you know, maybe collect your own data and start out small, and maybe collect really easy, low-hanging fruit metrics to demonstrate an improvement. Yeah. You know, it's what it takes to convince leadership to make the investment. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Being able to capture that break fix time and then link it back with the project that caused all that break fix time, I think, is the challenge to you know totally measuring the total cost of ownership of a particular service. Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.